going to get started. Wow, here we are, turning right around. Thanks for being here. It's a long day, turning right around and staying for State of the Church. So thank you for being here. I'm going to pray to get us started, and then we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, thank you for being your Manhattan, Lord, and thank you for these people that make up the spiritual body. Lord, I thank you for them, God. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for this church and for the story that you're writing, Lord, and uh, we just give ourselves and give the church to you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to zoom out and see the big picture a little bit. Um, we pray that you'd be speaking to us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, you know, I'm shooting to do this material in an hour and then release you at one if you don't have any questions. You know, if you have questions, you can stay. So that's what I'm shooting for. We'll see. You know, there's like 30 slides <laughs> in this slide deck. So we'll see if we... We'll see if we get there. Welcome, State of the Church. What are we doing here? Um, we are, oh, well, I, I thought I had a slide saying what we're doing. We're recapping where we've come from. Uh, we are talking about where we are a little bit, and we're talking about where we're going. So that's not on the slide at the moment, but I meant to have a previous slide where I give the overview. So that's what we're doing here. And we do these, sometimes I do these twice a year, do them at least once a year to just, uh, like I said, pull back the curtain, share about the functions of the church, finances, vision, all that sort of stuff, where we're going, why it matters, um, and give people a chance to feedback and talk and ask questions and that sort of thing. So um, if you have not come to one of these before, that's what we're doing here. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's start with uh, where, we, where we've come from because that's a great place to start. Um, I'm not going to recap everything because I did that all at the last day of the church. I was re-looking at the last day of the church. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we covered a lot of ground already in the last day of the church, a lot of change. And so, anyway, so, um, you know, high-level view, you know, where were we a year ago? You know, we completed the move into Cormdale. We're preparing for Easter. We did, like, a culture shift where we moved from a large staff team to a culture of volunteers. We had, like, 50% people volunteering. We were executing that change. A lot of people were getting in the game. It was really great. And financially, we had projected and, and we're running a conservative financial picture for 2024 because we lost $120,000 running the church model that we ran in 2022. We talked about all this last year. If you have questions, you know, whatever. But um, we, we talked about all this, and that's where we were. And we had more in the reserve that we had still expected. We had $200,000 still in the bank, but we had about $320,000 at the beginning of 2022. So we had lost a significant amount of money, and so we were projecting a very conservative uh, financial picture for this year. So that's where we were at the beginning of last year. And 2023 in review, sort of where we are now and, and what did we do. And I'll be able to share some of this um, stuff, but, you know, someone who's better at collecting this information than I am would have a whole, like, ministry impact report thing. And that would be a wonderful thing if that existed. But it's just not my strong suit, and so I'm just pulling things that I remember and that sort of stuff. Maybe you remember and have some contributions. But these are the things that I remember in terms of what we've done. So i share a little bit about the life of the church over the last year. Ministry, what did we do? And then financial, how did we, how did we do? So the life of our, of our church, we've had some additions to the life of our church. We've had some departures. Um, you know, we probably still have, and this is about the same from last year, about 75 people in or around Vineyard Manhattan. If there's like an email list that I keep that has, you know, the people, the only people on this email list are people who I think are still really around this community. Um, you know, it's not like people I hope are coming back or something on a list. And that list has 74 people on it. So uh, there's that list. And then I would say in terms of people who, you know, really attend um, Call Vineyard Manhattan, their church home, we're probably somewhere around 40 or 50 people. There were 67 distinct tithers in 2023, which is just a, a helpful metric in terms of thinking about this because, you know, people who care about the church are giving. And so we had 67 distinct different people tithe in 2023. Um, we've had some new faces come and join us, and we've had some losses. Our gains have been relational gains or people finding us online. We still get people come in. We have people today who are like, hey, I'm from a vineyard church. I'm looking for a vineyard church. So we had that. And then we've had some losses from sort of uh, New York City churn, which just happens, right? People moving, people moving ar around the city, moving out of the city. But then we've also had some people, you know, just frankly, who have left because they've said, uh, when this church was transitioning, I thought this might be the church for me, but just as we're here over this year, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if it is. So, um, and I've, you know, let those people go, honestly. I, I'm, uh, I, I want to tell everyone why I think Vineyard Manhattan is the church home from them, but I'm not going to like, you know, twist somebody's arm, you know, at the same time. And so there have been a couple situations where I've said, I don't know, maybe you do need to look for a different church. So that's just reality. Um, and uh, again, in these sorts of things, I'm just trying to be really frank um, and just not, you know, lie or sugarcoat things. So, 
But it's funny, with, with the new people that we've added, we're really uh, around the same place numerically as we were in, in 2023. So. Um, so anyways, that's just a little bit about just the life of the church in terms of who's actually here. Um, ministry, we've done uh, a number of things, especially for a small church. We maybe could do more. I don't know. You can decide. But in terms of community building, we've done a lot of community building this year. Um, and I'm going to speak to this a little bit later. But we've done a lot of just sort of relational solidity stuff this year and having like one peaceful, easy, stable year after many, many years of change and up and down and all that sort of stuff. A lot of this year has been about being together. So we've done a lot of small group events. We've done a lot of community events that are like about being together and having fun. And there are people, one of them's here, Bree has done a lot in that regard in terms of like helping us have fun together, helping us be together. You know, th these, you know, uh, game nights, th those sorts of things, they're not just like things we do to fill the calendar. They're things that, that build relationship and bring us into a relationship with one another. So we've done a lot of that. We've done some outreach and mercy stuff. Um, we did the coat drive. We had some immigrant families who were uh, with us in January and February of this past year who we met some immediate needs for them. Sarah Lundberg had a lot to do with those things. We've continued to um, do uh, volunteering and outreach with the Bowery Mission, and then Andrew put together a wonderful back-to-school event in the fall as well. So those are some things that we've done. In terms of courses, we've ran Alpha um, this past year. Um, the, the, the thing to me that has been the most joy for me has been the Bible class. We have a, a group of people who are like doing the hard work of reading the whole Bible in a year. It's just been really, really wonderful. Um, excuse me. And like that has been like almost an every Thursday thing for, for a long time. I mean, it's like these people are really, they're, you know, a year long commitment's a long time. So God bless you guys. And we, we've been doing that. Um, we've been doing a number of things with our benevolence funds and mission and justice funds. So we've been meeting, um, financial and housing uh, needs that people have had. Um, there have been a number of different requests that have come in. One of the larger requests was there um, was a uh, young guy who was around the church for a little bit who needed so who had some immediate housing and food needs, and, and we gave to him out of the Benevolence Fund. We had a, a giver at the church give over and above to, to be able to um, house this person for a week while they were in between uh, jobs and need to get their feet under them uh, with respect to employment. So those are some of the things we've done with that. We also have um, paid for therapy for two individuals who, after I announced that, hey, we're going to start to use our benevolence fund to be to also um, give people therapeutic resources if they have experienced significant trauma, especially physical trauma, that they've never been able to uh, get some healing for in a therapeutic context. We had two people reach out to us, and we funded um, therapy sessions for them over the past year. And you know, I, I'm, I'm never, you know, asking them, hey, give me a report or anything. But I do check in and say, has it been life-giving? Is, is this? And, and the answers are always yes. So um, that's been a really wonderful thing. We also have some organ organizational giving. We have, um, you know, we've, we tithed last year our organizational giving money, and that is going to four places. We have a, a tithe that we give to Vineyard USA. That's a 3% tithe on all, everything that comes in to our general tithes and offerings. So we've given to Vineyard USA this year. We also gave one of our mission and justice checks to the Bowery Mission. We gave a second $2,500 mission and justice check to um, Laura Collins, who is Hannah's sister, and she is doing work with YWAM, and she moved to Italy, and she's um, preparing missionary teams that hopefully are going to have an impact on the Middle East. And um, she, Laura, was just part of our church for a couple months at a time over the last year. And one day I was like, uh, I feel like, you know, we, we, we hadn't identified other ministry partners, which, you know, larger conversation around that. And I was like, I think we're supposed to give one of these to Laura. It's been wonderful to have her with us. And so, uh, you know, I checked in with the elder team, and, you know, they said, yeah, that'd be a wonderful use of that gift. So we, we gave to that as well. Um, a third organizational gift that we gave this year that I just decided to do in the last month was to an organization called Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope is a ministry in the city that tries to create spaces for faith for LGBTQ people. Um, I uh, uh, got an email from another pastor that said, hey, I know this organization. They're doing ministry to LGBTQ people in the city, and they need some money to, to, um, to make them qualified for, like, a large gift match thing. And, uh, you know, we had about six weeks left in the year, and we hadn't identified a giving partner. And so I chose to give to them. Uh, just a detail about that. I chose to give to them before clarifying with them whether or not their beliefs about sexuality match the beliefs of our church. Um, and I did that because I wanted to have a particular win of saying to the people who run this ministry, um, I, I don't know that we would give every single year, but what you're doing for LGBTQ people in the city is valuable, and I'm not going to put you through the theological ringer in order to you know, give you a check. Um, and so I chose to give to them you know, regardless of that. I ended up having a great conversation with them afterwards, and I do think that uh, we actually share a lot of the same beliefs. 
but uh, again, that's not why I, I chose to give to that. So I, I chose on my own to give to that organization because of those values. Um, and I also chose to give in a one-off way that I don't know if I would repeat in the same way every single year, but there could be people who have concerns about um, the nature of that gift or giving to an organization that do they or do they don't align with our beliefs. And if you have concerns about that, you can talk to me about that. You can talk to the elder team about that. Uh, it's a high priority for me that the money that goes out of Vineyard Manhattan is given in such a way where you go, I, I, that gift is a representation of me as, as a church body. And I feel uh, very, uh, I, I care very deeply about you feeling uh, good about the, those things and those sorts of gifts and where our money goes. So if you have concerns about that or further questions that, about that particular gift, um, I'm not beyond reproach, and you can ask me about that. We're going to ask the elder team about that because they had questions, and we had a conversation about that as well. So you should feel very comfortable asking the elder team about that. Um, finally, we've done a lot of stuff on Sundays, and people have volunteered a ton, and we've grown a ton in prayer ministry. Um, you know, what we're doing in terms of ministering God's spirit to people in that time of ministry in, in the service is, is really unique, and I actually probably don't think it's happening quite in the same way anywhere else in the city as where it's happening right here. The way that people are just being revelatory and honest and saying, this is going on in my life right now, and then we are trying to learn and grow at how to listen to God and minister the power of his spirit to people right now. I, I think that that is actually a unique thing that's happening right here. Um, and I want that to continue to grow and be something that is distinctive of what people are experiencing when they're worshiping with us on Sundays. Um, finances. I'm going to just give an update on 2023 finances um, with respect to budget fidelity and how do we do, and then 2023 giving. Um, the approved 2023 budget was 23. I don't know how to say any of these numbers. How do I say it? $235,000. Yes. <laughs> if Laura's nodding at me, I've gotten it right. Um, the, 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 the budget that I presented to you last year actually said $230,000, but really quickly after approving that budget, um, I realized that there were some budget categories that we missed, and so I asked to create a $5,000 additional budget category that was not a slush fund for whatever, but for things that we had just missed, like some staff travel stuff came up that we needed a budget category for, so um, the elders approved an extra $5,000. By the way, when I say an approved budget, if you ever had questions about this, we keep um, all our budgets and all the financial documents related to them, and also records of like elder votes on things in a Google Drive. So if you you know, so like like in the Google Drive for 2023, I have the record of the elders voting to approve the $230,000 budget, but then I also have a record of the elders saying, yes, we will in this moment provisionally add an extra 5000 I We keep all of those things so that you can have confidence that we are handling your money with integrity. So if you have questions about that, again, uh, there are people that you could talk to, and we would be able to open that up for you. So we also had an early add-on in 2023 of $30,000 for part-time hires, and that's related to the fact that Vineyard Manhattan was awarded a CRF grant through City to City. I can't remember if I've shared about this here. I've talked a couple times in past state of the churches about some additional source of funding that we may have access to. Well, we have access to it. We got a $100,000 grant that's dispersed over three years to be used towards like part-time staff, staff stuff and part-time hires. Um, we do have to pay 50% of that back over the next five years, so I'm the sort of person who just you know wants to throw $50,000 in the savings account and not touch it and just pretend like we only got $50,000, you know, I don't know, that's just the way that my mind works. But, so we added that on, and so uh, had some extra expenses, right? So like you'll say, spent $269,000. Well, that's, you know, the 235 plus the 30 k right? Because we, we were spending that grant money towards part-time uh, staff hires, George and Andrew. So, so 2023 expenses, right? 269,066.7, that wasn't right, Laura. <laughs> And change. Um, 34,103.63 was part time hires. And so, just, just mapping you through, walking you through this, right? Th that $34,000 of that was part time hires, which is related to the 30K for part time hires, minus the extra CRF expenses, right? Brings us down to the expenses 234953.08. And then 2936 over budget giving to Vineyard USA because we had more tithes come in than we expected. Right, so a small chunk of those extra expenses where we just give 3% to Vineyard USA, whatever we tithe on, we projected we would give to them X amount of money based on our tithes, but more tithe money came in, so we gave to them more, right? See what I'm saying? So minus the CRF grant plus, minus in the CRF grant and the extra VUSA money, we spent 232, however you say it, 17, blah, 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 0.08, 
which is um, $2,982.82 under budget and is within you know, 2% of the budget. So I, I, I share those things with you because I, I hope that this looks to you like financial fidelity. I hope it looks to you like people who said that we would spend the money in a certain way and we spent the money in that way. Okay, so that was uh, that's the update with budget fide fidelity for 2023. Um, uh, you know, in particular, I I'm grateful for the opportunity to walk you through this because, you know, I mean, just on on a personal level, you know, standing before the church last year and saying, "Hi, we lost $120,000," is probably just about the most embarrassed I've ever been in my entire life. And so, to be able to to be here and say, "Hi, we do care about fidelity. We're able to be financially faithful." To keep all of those sorts of things, uh, I am just grateful, um, you know, that the people in this room didn't hear the news from last year and go, "Who are these maniacs?" You know, I'm out of here. But you gave us an opportunity to show you that this is possible, and it is. And so I'm just grateful for that personally. Um, uh, giving and balance sheet for 2023. So we budgeted that we would get about $230,000 in ties, and in reality, we brought in about $396,000 in ties. So um, uh, I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, on top of that, we have the CRF grant, which is $100,000 over three years. Hope Astoria, for the second year in a row, has given us a gift as a result of their Hope for New York campaign, which is just over $11,000. And then we have $5,000 uh, that have come in through other sources and outside fundraising. So just in terms of our balance sheet, right, we ended 2022 with about $200,000 $200, in the bank, and we ended 2023 with about $389,000 in the bank. So we, we have put that money back, right, plus some, um, which is, you know, super positive. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, you know, it gives us an opportunity in this season to think about the strategic use of our funds. And again, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for your trust. I'm grateful that you've continued to give. Um, I'm, you know, many of you have given sacrificially. Some of you have given, you know, quite significant amounts. Um, people in this room are people who are giving financially to the church, and, and I'm really grateful for that. And it's amazing to like have put the money back that we lost. It. It's really amazing to have ended up with more. Um, a, another large part of that that we just need to acknowledge and be thankful for. Um, you know, I'm bummed they're not here right now to be able to say it um, personally with them here. But part of the reason why we're able to get that much money back is because we're getting a real deal on the Corm Deo space. So I mean, we you know it would be very easy for office space and community space and service space to run us sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year and we're getting quorum deo for like twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a year to get all of those things right so um, you know obviously we've we've gotten more because the quorum deo space has been willing to give us use of their really wonderful space at a fraction of what they could be getting if they wanted to charge us market rate and all that sort of stuff so um, so we should all be really grateful to the Kims and they're doing that also because they believe in what God is doing in vineyard churches and so you should too <laughs> okay um, so that's great. So 2023 is, you know, really a stabilizing year. Um, it's, well, it was about warm, healing community life. Um, it brings us a little bit of clarity around who is here and why, um, which, you know, I, I, you know, there's a text in Judges that speaks to this, you know, Gideon, if you know, God's just whittling down and whittling down. How are they drinking water? Are you cupping it or, you know, lapping it? Like, I think everyone here is in the, the dog lapping. I think that that's, Yeah. <laughs> Right, which of course is weird because sane people would cup it in their hands, right? Maniacs would just stick their face in the river. And I love that God has given me a room full of face in the river people. I just love it. I do. I really, really love it. I'm so grateful. So I, I love it. Uh, really fantastic. And uh, I think there's something uh, spiritual about that. Um, and so I, I, I believe in the people in this room. I believe that God has brought you here for this time, and I believe in what God is doing through you and through us in this church in this season for New York. So um, I feel awesome about all of that. Uh, and financial stability. We restored financial losses, and we're well positioned for 2024. So, um, so that's sort of recap on 2023. Let me see here. Yeah, thank you. I'm really super grateful. Really, honestly, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your commitment to the church, to its people. Thank you for your commitment to the church through... Um, a bunch of tumult and upheaval. Thank you for your sign of new life and <laughs> Th thank you. I'm really and thank you for giving. I I'm really really grateful. Um, also, you know, our survival over the last you know 12 to 18 months has as much to do 
with the relational equity of the Dubois and the Harms as it does with anything else. Um, and so, you know, and not only that, but the elder team has, you know, um, we, we've, we've had a lot of people jump in in the volunteering capacity. There's still things that would just be falling on my shoulders if the elders were not willing to say, we will be five hour a week staff people that are unpaid and we will make sure the operational thing happens. So, you know, the live stream really wouldn't be happening without Ann and, <laughs> and Matt and the coffee would not be happening without Ethan. I mean, these are operational things. And in our, in our governance model, which, are, which I'll speak about a little later, the elders are, are not operational people. They're not people who join the elder team so that I can ask them to do a bunch of stuff. But this elder team has said, you can ask us to do a bunch of stuff if you need help. And so they've done that. And so there are things that you experience operationally that um, uh, wouldn't be happening if, if one of the elders weren't carrying it. And so you should be grateful to them, too. So thank you. Thank you, Dubois. Thank you, Holmes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, we're really clicking along. Um, I want to talk a little bit about vision for this next year. And... I'm going to do my best. This is, I, th I think there's some things that I'm going to be clear about. Some things I just don't quite know exactly how to communicate them. So I'm going to try by sharing this first. Um, this is Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. This is like a really wild text, and it's of like a category of biblical texts that are revealing to us the immediacy of the reality of God that we often go through life just unaware of and, and not thinking about. Um, great Christian writers have always had a sense, and they're part, of, part of the reason that their writing is so great is that they have a sense of the fact that this could open up for them like at any second. <laughs> Like, this is actually part of their lived sense of what's, like, actually real. Like, that's, that, that the distance between us and God is actually as close as just a door opening, like, right now, and the Lord of heaven and earth walking through. Paul talks about this, right? He talks about there, like, being a veil that it just feels, actually, at the end of the day, paper thin. <laughs> really, really thin. And... The thing that I, I want to share with you today, that again, I don't totally know how to share this or why it matters, but that is just trying to get some of this through in a more immediate way, is that I've seen this. I would almost use the language of, I've been there. Like, I've actually seen this door that John is talking about in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, which I know sounds borderline insane, but I... I Ten years ago, uh, like on the night of December 31st, turning to January 1st of 2014, I went to sleep and I had a dream of incredible power that was more real than anything I've ever seen or touched or tasted. And I looked up and, and this door appeared in the sky. And it was, the, it was as though it was the most natural thing in the world. It's like I, I always knew that it was there. I just couldn't imagine how it was there, but I knew that it was. And this door opened up, and I began to float up into the sky. I don't know what else to say. I began to this come up here. I, I began to, to rise upward, and I saw before me, I, 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 in the heavens, this form of a man. And the whole cosmos was bound up in his form. It was like the whole pulsing reality of everything that God made was smashed into his form. And I was like speeding up towards him. And all of a sudden I, I saw before me, like on my way towards him, this huge line in the sky, this huge wrapping in the sky of coals, just fiery coals. And I wanted so badly to get up past those coals, but I knew that like I would just disintegrate 
once I got to them. It's like I could feel their heat, and I, like even though I was still far off. And I wanted to pass them, but I knew that I couldn't. And I found the words, protect me, Jesus, like welling up in me. Like I knew that somehow Jesus was going to get me past this layer of fire and into the thing that was beyond it. And I, I had that moment and then just began to just dramatically wake up. I just shot up out of bed. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Part of the reason why you know that I had this experience authentically is because I woke up willingly at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm terrible with mornings. But I was up. I mean, I was, my body, my, I, I was just, every element of reality was under a microscope. And I went out, and I wrote it all down. And as I was preparing for today, I went back, and I looked back at this thing 10 years ago. And, and, and what I wrote, and, and putting it all down, and there's an immediacy about what's actually going on here to me because I've, I don't know what else to say. I've seen that. When I say God said to me, I do not say that lightly. It's become very commonplace for people in this setting to show up and go, God said to me, God said to me, God said to me, God said to me, God said to me. And look, I believe that God can speak to you, and I believe that God speaks to you at times in ways that are casual and kind of, I don't know, democratic, where he's just like, God loves to speak. But for, for me, I have like a hierarchy of senses of like, I've got some down here, some vague senses. Then like in the middle, I've got, I'm pretty sure God said it to me, but then I have a category of four experiences in my life. This is one of them where I will never be convinced that it was anything other than divine reality. And this is one of them. And because I, I have this, the whole Christian story just makes obvious sense. Because someday, all of the little things that we're concerned about today are going to turn on a dime when that wall that you thought was just a normal thing, all of a sudden, there's a door there. And you go, oh my goodness, the whole thing was true. That's going to happen. Now, how do you get this experience into you? Well, God can reveal it to you. God can give you revelation. And God does that. That is one way. Of course, the trick with revelation is that you and I are in uh, a posture of total lack of control in terms of when revelation comes to us and when we get revelation and when we see and perceive revelation. So you should be praying to God for revelation. You say, God, give me revelation. But, but other than that, you're just waiting. The second way that this could become true for you is if you would believe what I'm telling you. If you would say, you know what? What you're saying to me is trustworthy witness that this thing is real. And that would actually get it into your life right now as well. Something is not right in the church in the Western world today. Something isn't right. It's not going right. We all vaguely know this. We all talk about different symptoms of how it's not going right. People are leaving with incredible speed. There's a book that's coming out where some of the authors in the book are arguing that the de-churching of America is happening at a speed greater than the first and second great awakenings combined, like with incredible speed. Um, the church continues to lose ground culturally, by which I mean when people generally or culture asks questions of the church, uh, or sorry, asks questions about things that are meaningful, life, law, morality, nobody says anymore, I wonder what the church thinks. In, in, in fact, if, if they ask that question, they're asking it to figure out opinions that they think they should rule out immediately, <laughs> right? Honestly, just continuing to lose ground as something that has any sort of cultural resources, stability. And then there are conduct issues inside the church that are all over the place. Something is wrong with pastors, Something's wrong with spiritual leaders where their lives are not matching what they say that they believe. But something is also wrong with people generally, where we are just, we could use different language to talk about this, but we're not particularly well formed in the faith. We're, we're not, you know, we're having to sort of struggle all the time to re-remember the basics. We, we're not praying or reading our Bibles. I mean, it's the central basic stuff that we're not doing. We're not telling people about our faith. Not that we do that all the time, but like, you know, you tell people about things that you think are real and that matter, you know, and like <laughs> in my own life, Stanton and I were talking about this, like we are quicker 
to evangelize about Instacart maybe than we are. And honestly, that's because I think Instacart is real and I think it would make a difference in your life, right? And so we just have these things revealing to us that like something isn't right uh, in the church and in response to our faith. And, and, and in this place, I think churches are doing two things right now. When I look at churches, I think churches are mostly doing two things right now to try to address these things. Um, and when I say the things that I'm about to walk through, it's not that these things are bad. They're obviously not bad. But certain churches right now are doing these things as a matter of first things. This is the first thing that they're doing. Um, some churches are doing neighborhood renewal. And the basic idea here is, you know, the church needs to rehabilitate its reputation with the world. And so we're going to do that by moving into neighborhoods or moving to a geographical area and working to do good in the world and to rehabilitate uh, that neighborhood. And so we do physical signs of things that are good in the world. A second thing that's happening is people are saying, we need more intense discipleship. We're saying the problem, we've looked at all the problems in the Western church and we've identified one. The problem is we're doing a bad job of making disciples. And so we're making people with dedicated practices and we're saying, how do we go about making better, more robust disciples? Um, these things are good and wonderful things and every church should be doing some form of these things. But my question is, what really is the problem and what should a church make a matter of first things in order to address the problem. And I think that there are two issues with these things as being the first major thing that the church is doing. The first thing is that at the end of the day, the first item is ultimately indistinguishable from Western secular humanism. The reality is that everybody wants to be good today. Everyone wants to be good. Everyone wants a moral cause. Everyone wants my life to have meaning because I'm doing something that's good. Everyone wants to donate to a community renewal nonprofit. Everyone, and so when churches are doing that, that's a good thing. It's biblical that churches should be doing that. But if that's the main thing that we're doing, it's just not distinguishable from Christian faith. It isn't. It ends up looking like the exact same thing. And to the watching world, people are like, you know, I, good. I'm glad that you're in a church that, does this good thing for your community, but there, nothing else is clicking in terms of why does a relationship with Jesus matter? And like, do I need to be saved from anything? And is God real? And what kind of difference does that make? And what is this thing called eternal life? And should I care about that at all? N none of this stuff is happening as a result from just making the main and only thing that we're doing. How can we make the world around us physically better? And the second thing um, the intense discipleship thing, you know, this is tricky because, of course, a living disciple has markers in their life of the fact that their discipleship is alive. But when we diagnose the problem in the church today as a, we need to make better disciples, how can we form better disciples? We immediately sneak a law dynamic into what we're doing. And, and what this becomes when it's the first thing, when it's not tied to anything else, when there's not spiritual reality behind it, is it becomes another list of things for you to do and get right. And so it just becomes another bar that you're trying to jump over. And the reality is that people have been talking about disciple making and all this sort of stuff and lamenting the state of discipleship for a long time and new strategies come in and out. But all of them are trying to hit this target. If only people did more stuff and if only people did more of the right stuff, then they would actually be formed into disciples. And I, I think that there is an important place for that in the church, but it's not the first thing. And when it becomes the first thing, all we're offering people is a new, cool, repolished law dynamic where I can now jump over all these practices. And the real reality is that anything that is governed by a law dynamic doesn't actually create the goals that the law is looking at. What it creates is hypocrites. Anything that is governed by a law dynamic produces a very particular kind of person, a person who really wishes they got all the rules right and then lies about it when they don't, and then judges other people for not getting the rules right. The law fits within a broader spiritual picture of what God is doing. I'm not throwing the law out. I'm not saying rules don't matter, but I'm saying as the main thing, as the first thing, they're very good at creating a certain kind of person, and that is a liar and a hypocritical person. And this is what Jesus said to the Pharisees when he was alive, right? Governed by a law dynamic, you actually are blind guides. So, I think that the true nature of our problem is not a matter of morality and discipline and doing more stuff better and getting it right. I think our problem is a matter of spirit and of faith. 
I think that our vision of spiritual reality has been totally gutted and truncated such that you are walking around not really actively living or believing in any of the things of God. You don't really believe in heaven. It's not making any difference for your life. You don't believe in eternal life. You're not walking around saying, I'm an eternal creature. What difference does that make for me? You're not, none of these things, these eternal things, these precious eternal truths that are actually the things that change your life, you're functionally walking around without any of them. The one thing that people are holding on to is the idea of God's eternal law and the idea that I might be sinful in response to that. And of course, that is true. It's part of the story. But when that's divorced from everything else about spiritual reality and what it means for us to live if God is alive, then it just becomes like a legal contract. And then like the only people who want to be involved are people who like like legal things. Like I really need someone to tell me that I'm getting the legality of the Bible right. You know, and it just is not, it's not working. We don't actually have power to live in a different way because we're running on efforts. Let, let me ask this of you. How did Jesus' disciples actually change? Right, we have all this language around discipleship, da, 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 how people change. Jesus had 12 guys who follow him around, right? In the moment of revelation, the moment where they were going to be revealed to, to, to where, where who they are actually was being revealed, right? The moment of Jesus' arrest, his betrayal, right? 11 out of those 12 people failed the test. One of them failed the test so badly that he put the whole test in motion. One of them just betrayed Jesus, failed the test that badly. And really, I mean, in that sense, you look at Jesus and you're like, you only had one out of 12 that really failed it. Right? I mean, I don't know, it's not that bad. But like 10 of the other ones were like, yeah, I'm, no, I don't know that guy. I'm not following that guy. Think about Jesus' disciples. They spent three years walking around with him, asking him their questions, learning from him. And yet 11 out of those 12 were not formed into disciples of Jesus such that they would pass the test when the rubber hit the road. However, somehow in the book of Acts, they're all different. And they all are faced with that test again, and they all get it right over and over and over again in the book of Acts. When their discipleship is tested by the question, um, are you a disciple of Jesus? And by the way, a yes answer is going to cost you. All of them pass the test over and over and over again until it finally costs them their life. How did that happen? What's missing in between? Well, what's missing in between is the resurrected Jesus. They encountered Jesus spiritual reality, they beheld him and they believed in him. It was an encounter with spiritual reality, something that was both not in their control because it came to them, but something that they then laid a hold of through faith, that that become, became something living in their life that made them then get the law right. That's how they actually changed. It wasn't just, I mean, all the other things that the disciples had access to. They spent a bunch of time with Jesus. They heard him teaching. They, they watched him with other people. All of those things did not result in their change, but one minute with the spiritual reality of the living God did. How do people get access to this? Well, God can reveal it to them, or they can see a compelling witness that calls forth faith in them, and they can believe it. And that's how they get it. Jesus actually says this to his disciples in John. He's like, oh, you believe in me because you got to see the thing? Blessed are those who just hear the testimony of it and get it into their lives by believing. I think that our church needs to first be about calling people to faith in God. And this is, uh, it sounds like an obvious thing, it's, uh, but it's, it is a first thing. Somebody needs to be calling people to behold the reality of God and to believe in him as a matter of first things. That should usher forth into our lives in living spiritual practices that look like a disciple. And we should do signs in the physical world of the reality of the kingdom of heaven. But none of it works if people do not have living 
faith. And we, too often in this space, are in a time where our faith has been so truncated by the world that we don't have living faith. So there's a twofold task here. Faith for us, but then calling other people to faith. And in this sense, we're calling everyone in this church to do the same thing. Secular people don't have faith. Too often, religious people don't have faith. We just have a sense of a legal relationship with God. But it's forming something weird in us, something judgmental, something hypocritical, something unkind, because it's not born out of spiritual reality that comes into our lives through living faith. Faith in all of the things of God. What are we doing as a church? Getting clear in this season about what specific, not just sort of who we are broadly. I'm going to talk about this. I've been thinking about vision over the last two years in relationship to like a vineyard church. You know, what is a vineyard church and how do we blah, blah, blah. And I just have been thinking of the last three months. It's just not clear enough because it's not clarifying exactly what we are doing and where we are going. Our current vision stuff is talking about who we are. And it basically is language that we're a vineyard church, speaking kingdom words, praying kingdom power, doing kingdom works. Wonderful. It's a descriptive thing. Also, I mean, just, and this is an indictment of me, the fact that it doesn't have really any power is reflecting the fact that those words aren't making a difference in your life. They're not making a difference in a sense of who I am as a follower of Jesus. And so I'm looking at all that and I'm saying, what's going wrong in terms of our fundamental understanding of who we are and where we're going and why it matters? And I'm clarifying it around calling people to faith and witnessing to the spiritual reality of the living God and the spiritual reality of the things of God so that people will behold it and believe it and they'll get God's life, the spirit of Christ into them and the other things will then become uh, able to flow out of them. So we're calling people to faith. I'm talking about faith in three senses, like a noun, belief in Jesus specifically. We, that is happening. We're doing it. And we are going to get good at doing it, at calling people to faith in Jesus. I also mean it as, the, as broadly like the content of a belief system, right? You, you might say to people, um, <laughs> oh gosh, you might say to people, I have a faith, right? And what do you mean when you say that? You're talking about, you're, you're talking about the content of a belief system, right? Christian faith. But there is a third way that I'm talking about faith that is almost important on its own, and it's the verb form of faith. It is the power of believing in my life such that I'm, I have access to spiritual things, right? And this is not just faith in Jesus. It is believing in God in an area of my life. And this, for, for us in the church, if we're really honest, this third, the verb form of faith is too often functionally dead. It's dead. It's not happening. We, we don't look at various situations in our lives and go, God, I don't know what's going on here, but I believe that this is a place where you will reveal yourself to me. That is actually power to get spiritual reality into our lives, and too often we are not doing that. We are just walking through our life with this sort of faith dogma thing in the background, and then we're like, I'm a Christian. What, is that, what does that mean? I don't know. I was raised in the faith, or I have friends. It would be really costly to, to throw it out, but functionally. Faith in God as spiritual power is not making a functional difference in my life. And if we're going to call people to faith in Jesus, we have to call people into a living faith. And so we are preaching this to ourselves as a church that is going to be calling people to faith. If we are doing this well, what are we really creating? Right? If we're, you know, if we're creating, you know, if, if, if a church that is just about community renewal is creating good neighbors, that's a wonderful thing. If a church that's just about, we're finally going to get discipleship right, gets people who have a lot of practices and structures in their life. That's a wonderful thing. We are trying to create spiritually alive people. And I, I, I honestly don't know how else to say this. I feel like it's not immediate enough because the language of spirit even has a religious wash to it. I'm trying to make you a spirit creature. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to make you somebody who has one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. I'm trying to make you somebody who is immaterially alive with the life of God. That, I, that My belief is that the gospel, all the way down, is about ontological change. That your being changes. It's not just about behavior modification. It's not just about becoming nice. It's not about what, whatever it is. It's about actually becoming a different creature. 
And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says that this is where you are going. He says that when you are raised to life in the resurrection, the nature of your body is going to change. You, You should read 1 Corinthians 15. If your mind has been removed from the reality of the things of God, Paul says that when you are raised to life, this natural body will give way to a spirit body. And I am trying to get us to get that power now. Unfortunately, I cannot give you a spirit body. But the same power that will become eternal life for you, that power can become the power of eternal life in you now. And that makes you loving when you have no more love to give. That makes you gracious when your flesh wants to be punitive. That makes you kind when you want to be judgmental. That makes you courageous when everything around you in the world would make you a person of fear. And that makes you want to do things in the physical world, not just to be good or to be nice, but to show people in the world what heaven is like. To say, this is what heaven is like. And when we're out in the world doing stuff for people, we don't just want them to say, oh my gosh, Christians are so nice. My view of them is changing. Now maybe I'll come to a potluck. God, that's so boring. I want people to see what we're doing in the world and go, heaven is real. I miss that. But I believe in it now. And the power of God's eternity is getting in me. I've tried to say this in different ways. We're a church that's about God. We're a church that's all this sort of stuff. But isn't this the thing that you actually want? If you want all the other stuff, there are other places that you can go that are doing all the the programs and they're doing it better. We, We are trying to do the things that show people that heaven is real so that they will believe in it and get the life of God into their life now. We also happen to believe that that life is a seed that actually will literally grow into an eternal person. This is what the church is about. All of the problems in the church are because the church has walked away from this. That's what I believe. Think, for example, about just like the rash of pastoral misconduct in the world. So much of that is about the fact that pastors and spiritual leaders are comfortable with fudging the truth. So much of that is that we've become comfortable with lying in different ways. Not, and, and it's often not just the explicit lies, it's the little lies. It's the withholding of information. It's the making thing, something look better than what it is. And, and, and just follow me here for a second. People become comfortable doing that once functionally spiritual reality is dead in their lives. Because if you really don't believe in spiritual reality, And you tell a couple lies, but you like win some gospel good on the other side of it, right? Like more people came to faith because that we sold them a more hyped up version of, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Right. And you go, you go, you know what? We told a little fib and it just doesn't matter because something good came out of it. That is how our world lives. Our world lives that way. Our world is willing to fudge the truth and lie and make myself a new person in every career move, whatever, to just. To, to achieve some sort of good whatever. But if someone believed in spiritual reality, they would go, you know what? I don't know why telling the truth in this situation is important. But I know that lying is a particular form of speech that was invented by Satan. And so every time I lie, somehow in the spiritual realm, I have a huge <laughs> bags and bags and bags of lies that are building up. And at some point, they are all going to come crashing down. They're going to crash down on me. And even worse, they're going to crash down on all the people whose faith is related to me. And it's going to kill their faith. That is going to happen no matter what. Because spiritual reality is real. And lies are a part of dark spiritual reality. And so we don't lie no matter what. All these problems in the church are just related to these eternal things being functionally dead in our lives. And it's time to wake them up. It's time for us to wake up in relationship to them. I've changed our vision statement. Vision. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) I hated that old vision. 
that New York City would come to behold and believe in the kingdom of heaven, one New Yorker at a time. And that means that we are on a mission to witness to the reality of God so that people can behold God and to call people to faith in Jesus Christ so that they can believe and their lives can be changed. That's what we're doing at Vineyard Manhattan starting today and going forward into the rest of this year. So what's next with response to all this? Some questions. Um, organizationally then, as a result, what are we going forward? And I've got some answers to some of the questions you might have, and I've got some hows and whens to those questions. Um, some questions. What are we organizationally going forward, and what do we need to be that thing? So um, the big question for us after this last year is, are we a church plant, or, or are we a small church? I'm going to go backwards, so you can't just be reading that the whole time. <laughs> Are we a church plant or are we a small church, right? Do you see the difference? In one, we're saying um, we have some expression of our community that we want to grow into, right? It's not that we're just going to idolize growth all the time or whatever, but that we have some expression of our community that we are still growing into, and so we're on a journey to that thing. If we're saying we're a small church, we're saying we are comfortable being what we are, we'll just get better at being what we are, but we have a long-term vision for maybe just being a 30 to 40, 50, I don't know, person community in and for New York City for a long period of time. And I've done thinking about this. I've bounced some of the stuff off with the elder team about this. And well, and of course, on the basis of the answer to that question, what do we need to be that thing? And that's going to become a very important question organizationally. And the answer here is that we're a church plant. Okay, We are not a small church. We are right now, but we're on the, because we're through the church, you see what I'm saying, right? <laughs> in other words, what I'm saying is that we are saying we do not have a vision for grinding out small church life in New York City long term. That's what we're saying. We're saying we are a church plant, and so we are growing into the vision that we have, and we want to grow into it organizationally. And so we need church plant things in this season in order to accomplish those things. We need clarified specificity in vision and then organizational alignment with that vision. That includes functional things in our organization, but it also includes uh, organizational alignment in terms of what are we doing and how does that impact us culturally? How does that impact what we're doing and why does it matter? So um, with respect to this, right, clarified vision with specificity, what are we laser focused on calling people to faith and calling people in New York City to believe in the kingdom of heaven? What do we need organizationally to align with that vision? Um, First of all, uh, with respect to location, we need uh, a location that is calling New York City to belief, uh, which is more about living at the level of the borough and of the city. Did I miss something? Oh, great. Okay. Um, we, we are going to live at the level of the borough and of the city and not of the neighborhood. That doesn't mean we don't care about the neighborhood. It just means that even you in your life you are traveling around when you live in New York City. You work in one place, you live in another place. If, if Most people here right now, if you were to move, you would not go, oh my gosh, I have to stay in this neighborhood. You would probably say, I hope I'm you know, a 20 minute train ride from my church. Or, right? you, you, we, we live at the level of the borough and of the city. And so we are going to call people to faith at that level as well. So instead of saying we are like going to get really deep into a neighborhood, we're saying we want to be in New York City, but in a place that is accessible to people from all over the city. And so we, we want to be in Midtown West. Um, this space right here maybe even feels a little bit more Hell's Kitchen than it does Midtown West, but you know I, I'll talk about that in a second. And we also need a space that we can begin to grow into that has matching operations for what we're doing. So we need a new space. So that's one thing that's coming out of this. We are looking for a new building, a new space. And we want to move into a new space either by Easter or at the fall. Um, so one, of, one or two of those. I've been working on some of that. I've got a couple of people I've invited to look into some of that. We're having some conversations. There are some things that could be um, uh, positive you know, developments. There's nothing right now that's like, oh, my gosh, this is definitely it. But uh, we are, we're moving, and we're doing that this year. Um, when we move, ideally, I would love to be somewhere between like 7th and 9th and 40th and Columbus Circle. Um, ideally, somewhere close to like 8th Avenue would be great, although this gets a little tricky because we want the space to feel like Midtown West, not like Times Square. Um, if we're too far over to Times Square, we're going to become Tourist Church, which is a wonderful thing, and God bless Tourist Church, but that's not who we are, right? <laughs> I see a lot of people who are like, this would be the thing that would make me leave. <laughs> I, I've, I've stayed through all this stuff 
But this would be, this would, yeah, this rather broke the camel's back. This would, this would be too much. Um, and at the same time, there are certain spaces that feel more like, well, we're, we're moving into a neighborhood, right? And there are some spaces in New York that feel like the city more than they feel like a specific neighborhood. And we're looking for something that feels like that. So within that, something around 8th Avenue, I think is like the, the, the center of the target, but around Midtown West. If we were to say like second tier, we could stretch over into 7th or 9th. Although 7th, a lot of that's going to start to feel Times Squarey. And, and, and ninth, we're starting to head over a little bit into Hell's Kitchen. But again, if, if the right space were to come, we could broaden the parameters just slightly, right? Um, which part of the reason why I'm saying that is because there's a space across the street from us that could potentially be a good space. And it's a little bit further west than I wish it was. But if it ticked all these other boxes, then, then we would seriously entertain it. So, um, so, anyway, so that's one major update. And then um, with respect to organizational clarity and just an articulated faith culture, how we clarify and what we're doing in those things to be really vision driven, if you will. Um, so need a new space, ideally around 100 occupancy. We need church plant operations, which includes part-time hires. It includes a 2024 budget that is positioned to uh, treat ourselves like a church plant and not like a small church. We need some new branding. We need some operational upgrades and we need to put this organizational alignment into practice. So here in 2024, we are once again, taking our reserve and saying this is startup cash for doing what we want to do in order to get this up off the ground. So some of you immediately may be asking, didn't we just do that in 2022 and it didn't work and now we're going to throw a bunch of money away doing it again? And um, you could ask that question and if you want to talk more about it, you can. I, I, th I think personally the key difference here is that part of what we were trying to do in 2022 was hold together um, something that was cherished, that had come before, that included relationships that had come before, and to try to, to spend, to keep that intact while we're doing a new thing. And so our spending was stretched across a number of different categories. This budget here is built to spend on operational things that will grow us up operationally. And it's really clearly partitioned out for that. To say, what do we need to do to grow up operationally and organizationally so that we can move out of this life stage and into another one? I think that is the key difference. Uh, if you have more questions about that, you can ask me about that. So we've projected our revenue for 2024 as $340,000. Um, and then we have some additional giving that should come in with fundraising and the CRF grant. We've projected expenses at $490,000. So we have a large category of money that's about $120,000 that is preliminarily approved for these sorts of expenses. Organizational, operational, personnel upgrades that are needed to move us into a next stage of organizational life. So that basically puts us again on like a 24 month timeline with respect to the reserve that we have. Um, there are also some changes with respect to my salary and some staff salary stuff. So I'm gonna invite Matt Harms really quickly to come and share about those in, at this moment in the presentation. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to stand really close next to you. So <laughs> I'm going to get my coffee breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, um, so I'm at Harms, and my wife and I have been elders at first TGC and then to Vineyard Manhattan now for almost three and a half years. And it, one of the privileges of being the elders is to take a look every year at how we're compensating the staff, and in particular, Adam. And one of the things that Adam didn't mention, and probably never would, is that in order to make some of the budget numbers in past years work, or even look um, feasible, he and Stanzi have been chronically and persistently underpaid yeah. compared to the job that they do, the tremendous um, effort that he puts in, and even for our church our size compared to other churches in Manhattan. And so um, we were um, thinking about this year ways that we could help to make up some of that difference. And so one of the things that the elder team approved and the trustees looked over and, uh, and helped on was um, ratifying a $10,000 bonus this year to try to help catch up a little bit for some of that chronic underpayment for past years. We obviously aren't in the financial place to do it um, you know, much bigger than that, but we really wanted to honor Adam and Stancy for the sacrifices that they've made over the last three or four years that they've been here to kind of help the budget numbers add up even while they're putting their hearts out there and their lives on the line um, for us as a congregation. And then we also saw this year as an opportunity to basically bring Adam's salary up to something closer to what a uh, church our size can afford oh, wow. and what a church our size <laughs> and the amount of effort that Adam puts in um, to make that more 
So if you have questions about exactly what that is, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how, if I feel like we should be talking about that onto Zoom or what have you, but I'm happy, we're always happy to talk about it. If you mm -hmm. have questions about how we were thinking about that, why we came to that decision, um, please definitely approach one of us or Dubois uh, to ask about our thinking and, and how we prayerfully considered um, trying to bless Adam and Stanzi in this new season. Um, in particular, so that they don't have to figure out how to eke it out and can devote time and energy into helping live out this vision, and yes. this, this big uh, dramatic shift um, that we're undergoing. The last thing that we uh, did is, in an effort to kind of honor the fact that everyone, even pastors, need to put in time and energy for self-care, is we created a wellness benefit. It's not big, it's just a little bit of money each year that we want each of the staff people that the church is hiring um, a little set aside uh, pocket of money that they can use for gym membership or therapy or yoga, whatever it is that would help them kind of keep balance and, uh, you know, and wellness uh, a major focus in their, in their lives. So um, that's all I'm going to say. Do any of the other elders want to add anything or points that I missed? Okay, great. That's it. I'm super grateful for that, and I'm grateful to work with an elder team that feels not just okay with giving a pastor a raise, but feels good about it. Um, people have different relationships with pastors and money and finances and all that sort of stuff, and um, you know, I didn't get into pastoring to get rich, and I don't think that pastors should get rich, but I do think that pastors should not be expected to just be like scraping by all the time, and and sometimes there are communities where, where actually people do kind of expect that, and I'm grateful to be in a community where people don't expect that. I, you, I think that you should, you know, want me to not, like, lust after money and get rich. But, like, I also am super blessed when people are, like, we feel really good about paying our staff something where it's, like, they're, they're not just scraping by. And so I, I feel really blessed by that. And, um, I mean, I, I feel like that's actually an important thing that the church at large needs to learn right now because, I mean, pastors are going through a, a really difficult time. And I could do a whole thing on – the studies that are coming out about pastors and pastoral numbers, and it's bleak. It's really bleak. And, uh, you know, being in a community where people are like, look, we don't want to add any extra thing by just the, the ins and outs of your life not working because you're constantly scraping by. That ministers to me, mostly, honestly, on a spiritual level. <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that, and my family is really grateful for that. So thank you. I would encourage you, if you have questions about that, to, uh, to talk to the elders about it and I mean, I, I honestly don't care and in, so, in some ways think it's helpful if you have a ballpark of know what the staff makes and that sort of stuff. So I'm not squeamish about any of that. And it's just a part of valuing honesty and transparency generally. So please feel free to talk to the elders about that. All right. We're getting close. We're getting close. So some things about organizational clarity here. Uh, the word faith appears a lot on this slide. I'm not saying that we're like going to just, you know, be saying the word faith all the time. But if what we're doing is calling people to faith and as a result creating faith and growing in faith in Vineyard Manhattan, how is everything that we're doing aligned with what that is? So even things like that Sundays, like, you know, we think about Sundays and we're worshiping, I'm going to church. I, I want to get clearer about that, about how worshiping God on Sundays is, a, is really about creating faith. H how are we creating faith in, in, on Sundays? Not just growing in it, but birthing it. Uh, like in, in us, in our lives, but like when people who don't know God or who don't know our church, who are far from God, like what does it look like to be in a space where we are praying all the time who people that come and worship with us, faith is made in them as a result of our worship. I'm talking about that kind of clarity about all of our spaces. What are we doing in our small groups? There's a lot of things that you can do in a small groups and a lot of things churches do in small groups. They're all wonderful things. We're studying the Bible. We are uh, 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 being friends. All of that is good and wonderful stuff. But in our small groups, we want those things to happen by way of this thing, growing in faith. And it, you're going to find our small groups to be challenging places to be if you're like, I don't want to grow in my faith. right? Like, you can. You're welcome. But we are trying to grow up in our faith lives, and that's what we're doing in our small groups. And I want to bring that kind of clarity to all these sorts of things that we are doing. More things to talk about there, but that's what I'm talking about in terms of organizational alignment. And then in terms of organizational culture, these are things that are part of who I am that also now are mostly, I think, in our church community. I hope that these things are recognizable to you as things that are reflections of who we already are culturally. 
I want to talk about the open doors of faith, having a radically open and welcoming culture for people to be here and be on a faith journey and belong to a faith community regardless of anything else that's going on in their lives. Secondly, though, we have a high bar here when we talk about faith. We're, we're not just talking generally about some vague spiritual journey that may end up anywhere. We are talking about the reality of the living God who is holy, and so our lives should be holy, and the stakes here are eternal life or not. And so that all leads us to a very high bar in faith, and our being welcoming does not lead us to lower the bar in order to become welcoming, right? Um, we talk about honesty, and we talk about being honest people and leading in that way. And so I've talked here about being truth people, both in terms of being people of truth generally, but also being true people, people who love the truth and people who are true and honest in their own lives and relationships. That cultural value is something that we'll be working on in the EHR course. So much of healthy relationships, spoiler alert, is about being able to talk honestly. So much of it. Oh my gosh. I wish the course were called emotionally honest relationships, not emotionally healthy relationships. So much of it is about that. And then uh, I haven't used this language before, but we are thinking about faith here. People are asking questions. People are trying to think about things in nuanced ways. We open up the Bible, and we want to learn from the Bible, but we're not afraid of asking questions of the Bible. We are thinking here, and so I've called that being a gospel intellect. Maybe better language is gospel minds, gospel-minded, something like that. And then finally, we love to laugh at the church, and it's a cultural marker of who we are. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and that's going to continue to be the case, and it's a gift. Church should be joyful, and it should be fun, and we should laugh along the way, so we're going to continue to do that. Um, okay, um, real quickly, there's a lot I could dive into here, but I want to give you a quick overview of this. Another way that we are aligning what we're doing as an organization with updated vision stuff is through organizational structure. I have talked about this briefly in the past, but I want to outline it more clearly here. First of all, we have a governing document. It's called a constitution. We actually have two governing documents, bylaws and a constitution. Most churches just have bylaws and all the information is there. But in the history of our church, people functionally split out the bylaws, which are related to like our incorporation with the city and ultimate financial matters, with the constitution, which is related to who we are as a church, what governance looks like as a church. It, it, the constitution is the much longer and much more important document. You can read this document. In fact, I kind of hope you will. It's like 10 or 11 pages, and it lays out a ton about our, about our faith, wh uh, what it is to be us, uh, to a vineyard church, our beliefs, government. I mean, all of those things are laid out in the Constitution, and we operate according to this. The elder team and I have been working over the past three months to update that and re-clarify it, and we've just done that. So you should be able to read our latest um, Constitution document and to be able to go through an assessment and say, everything about how my church functions is right here. Um, within that, we have three governing bodies, trustees, elders, the word governing here is slippery, pastors are not governing, blah, 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 uh, trustees, elders, and then pastors. And the trustees are um, <laughs> uh, Alex DeSherbiton and John Kim and myself, and the trustees meets once or twice a year. It's a very important body, but in terms of its, its everyday functions, it meets much less frequently than the elders. And the trustees are asking big financial questions. They're asking stewardship questions. The trustees put in so many hours of work on the name change stuff. My God, you should thank them too for all the work that the name change. Stuff. How many times have we tried to get that form notarized? Too many times. Anyways, um, the, the elders and, and pastors generally are the bodies that are mostly functioning to steward the, the life of the church. And um, those two bodies uh, relate to one another through a pastor-led, elder-governed dynamic. In other words, pastors and staff at the church are responsible for direction, for spending money, for ministry, planning, all that sort of stuff. And the elders serve a governance function, and there are three levers to that governance function. Um, that is an operational minimum. Obviously, these two bodies should be in warm relationship with one another. But um, just structurally, how your church works, you have s pastors and staff that are running ministry and spending the budget stuff and all those sorts of things, and elders who hold governance functions with respect to approving finances, approving, um, the, uh, approving the budget through um, stewarding faith. It's like I can't show up here one day and say, hey, by the way, I believe that this new wild you know, teaching is true and it's in conflict with what the Bible teaches, but I don't care. I teach it. Actually, the elders actually have authority to say the elders steward our faith, and if we need to have a biblical conversation about changing belief, fine, but pastors just can't show up and do that. And then third, discipline. And 
Like, that's an important thing in the life of our community. And our, our elders have put in time this year to say, how can we help people and help things that are going on in our body to move them from harm to healing? And, I mean, your elders put in a lot of time. They do. They put in a lot of time in a lot of different areas. And you should be grateful for them. You should be grateful for them. You should thank them. Um, they, they really do. So, so with, within all of that, within all of that, there's an additional question about what sort of faith environment does a church offer? Like all this stuff I'm talking about, calling people to faith and growing in faith and blah, 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 blah. How actually can people experience that at our church? And there are often, uh, the, 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 the environment often that churches offer people is what I have called now for the last year and a half the dogmatic archery range, where, where what our church has to offer you is an opportunity to show up and get a bunch of things right in both your confession of faith and your actions. And once you show us that you can pull back the drawstring and shoot all the arrows at all the right targets, now you can be here. And you can be part of our, our community and you can be on a faith journey with us. And what I want to offer instead is something that I've called a spiritual pasture. A spiritual pasture is an environment where people can come from any background, any walk of life, whatever they're doing, whatever they're getting right, whatever they're getting wrong, and they can come and believe uh, sorry, and, and belong here and be pursuing living faith, but faith that's actually like biblical faith, like living biblical faith after the living God. Um, I, my, my convictions from this are drawn from revelations about God na God's nature and God's character in the scripture. I, the way I read it and see it, um, and this is uh, Exodus um, is it 31, 32, 33, right around there. Moses hiding his face. God's glory passing by. Wonderful passage, right? In that passage, Moses says to God, hey, uh, I love you. I, I want to I wanna see your glory. I'm going to be as close to you as I can. And God is like, that's a wonderful desire to have, but no. If, if, if you get that close to me, uh, bad things will happen to you. But you can hide from my face in this little cleft of this rock, and as I pass by, I'll tell you what my character's like, and you'll hear me say it. And in that moment, God hides his nature from Moses because his nature is holy, but he reveals his character to Moses, which is, somebody's got to be able to help me. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And I think that a church needs to be able to give an account before God of how we are accounting for God's nature and God's character in our church. We need to be able to give an account of how we are offering God's welcoming, gracious, merciful, forgiving character in the structures of our church, and at the same time, how that does not just become some low bar free-for-all where we're just doing whatever we want, and who cares about what the Bible says, and who cares about that? And so we're also able to say we are giving an account of how we are paying attention to God's holy nature at our church as well. And I'm trying to do that by inviting people in to a spiritual pasture where they can experience the wide open doors of faith, but have places in the pasture where there are faithful people who are feeding people the, the, the water of life and the words of the scriptures so that they're encountering the high bar of faith at the same time, okay? That's what we're doing that here. And we are instituting, uh, well, right now we're instituting one of these two because membership, it doesn't make total sense to do that right now. Once we grow a little bit, we'll put membership into place. But we're, you, we're doing this through two structures, membership and leadership. So membership is the structure that corresponds to the welcome of God. You can be a member here at this church and not fully believe with what we believe, not be living in a way that we believe accords with the Bible, but you can be here and be a member and belong. And this is drawn from a biblical theology of the body of Christ, that Christ offers his body to people to become a member of his body totally because he's a welcoming, forgiving, gracious guy. He doesn't wait for you to do anything before he offers you his body. And so we're not going to wait for people to do anything before we offer them ours. And at the same time, we are offering people true living faith in the authority of the scriptures, believing in the resurrected Jesus, corresponding to the holiness of the living God. And so we are stewarding this environment through a leadership structure of people who are essentially able to say this, all the words and deeds of Jesus are good news for me. In my life, in my belief, and to the best of my ability and my conduct, I am not essentially asking any questions about the teachings and the deeds of Jesus, about their truth, about whether they're good news for me, about whether or not I'm going to obey them. I am taking on in myself a high bar of discipleship, and I'm primarily doing that 
not to get special things, not to get an amazing, there are no stickers, you know, whatever it is that you think, yeah, yeah, Chris is out, (laughs) right? They're primarily doing that to begin to ask the question all the time, how can I help to create faith in people at this church? That's what a leader is doing at this church. So leadership and membership, I just talked about all that, yay. So elements of membership, I mean, honestly, you have to broadly, vaguely desire to pursue faith. You, you have to be for the church in some way, even if you don't agree with everything that we think or believe, right? Which is an important distinction. Members need to be able to say, look, I might not believe in all this thing. I might not be living my life according to that conduct, but I understand why Vineyard Manhattan teaches and believes these things. And even if I'm not in step, I'm not here to try to burn it down, right? That is a delicate place that a member needs to be able to be. A member needs to have literally any tithing practice, Literally any time. Some of you just realize what I mean by that. I, I, I am going, I, I do not check. I'm not looking up about what you tithe. I'm not keeping a list in the back of my mind. But with respect to these structures, I, for people who are saying, I am a leader already right now, um, I will be checking to make sure that they are tithing 10% of their income to the church because we give in a level that matches the spiritual responsibility we're taking on. And if you want to be a member of this church, I will be checking to see that you tithe. I literally will just be looking for your name. <laughs> you can, I, I mean, honestly, you can give a dollar and be a member of this church. I, there just needs to be something in your financial practice where you are saying, I have some buy-in and belonging here. If you're just giving a dollar, gosh, you can ask that question of yourself. But for me, I'm just saying, what does it look like for the structure to actually exist, right? And it has to have some something of belonging where people are saying, like, I believe in what's happening here. Literally any tithing practice. You can volunteer. You can lead social or connectional events or like mercy and outreach type things that we do. You can be in small groups and really belong in small groups. You can vote. At some point, we're going to get the membership covenant up and running. And when I nominate new elders, they will go through a membership vote. You can vote as a member to approve and ratify elders. It's welcome to, you're welcome to be belonging here. You can attend and give feedback at members only meetings. In the future, this sort of a space is going to be a members only meeting. People who are not members could ask to sit in and that would be fine. But in a space like this, and it's not even about the information, all the sort of information I would make publicly available to people, but this space needs to be populated by people who are saying, I belong here. It's not a space in the future for people to be like, I don't know, here's a, I could go to a movie at AMC or I could come to this, you know, members meeting, you know, whatever it is. It, it, it needs to be populated by a space of people who are saying, I belong here and I have some buy-in here. Um, this is what, and, and, and then being a member means that you are subjecting yourself to discipline according to general standards of member conduct, which some of you are like, oh God, discipline. You, you want this provision in here. What I'm talking about <laughs> is, the low, is the low bar of conduct that you just need to have to be part of a body. I will not run around and speak slanderously of people because I'm part of a body. I will not physically harm people. I'm part of a body. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking specific points of detail. I'm talking a level of conduct that is just fitting the low bar of how do we healthily belong as a body together. And members are going to be subject when they sign a membership covenant to saying, if I don't do that, I'm expecting the elder team is going to give me a call and say, what the hell is going on here? Leadership. <laughs> Elements of leadership are able to joyfully and truthfully affirm that all the words and deeds of Jesus are good news for me. They choose and probably are already taking on a high bar of biblical conduct that's subject to discipline according to that standard. They tithe 10% of their income. They're actively leading in some place of spiritual authority. They commit to volunteer and to be part of a small group. They sign a leadership covenant. They participate in leader meetings. They worship here. They're taxed with being biblically responsible for creating and stewarding faith. And they live their whole lives according to biblical wisdom, and are open to scrutiny. One thing that we're not doing.
or unstable person because they have something in their financial life that's driving them that you can't see. Our leaders choose to say, my, my life is not perfect, but my house is generally structured according to wisdom, and so people can lean on me, and I'm not going to fall apart when they do that because my life is built with wisdom. Right? This is like the person who's like, you know, I am at this church, blah, blah, blah. I have a terrible reputation at work. Ever, I do this stuff at work. I've been disciplined at work 30 times. You know, they kept me out because they couldn't fire me, but I embezzled a bunch of stuff. And, but I get to be a leader at church. You know, I'm going to ask you questions about that. I'm going to be like, that conduct does not correspond with what we understand to be going on over here. Here's the thing about leadership, and this is an important thing to say. Leadership is not something that you look at Vineyard Manhattan and go, oh my gosh, I want to be a leader. How can I tick off the boxes to become a leader? Leadership is something that, that you already are. It's something that you're already doing because it's the overflow of living spiritual life in the whole of your life. Mm -hmm. So even things like this, like the tithing or whatever, like there's language in the leadership covenant that's like you have to be doing that for six months before you're eligible for the leadership team. Because it's not something that you're just like, oh God, I've got to be a leader. I guess I've got to tithe more. Do you have this kind of a tithing practice as a living part of your spiritual life? And if you do already, then you are a leader. <laughs> right? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So leadership at Vineyard Manhattan is not about, oh my gosh, I want it. It's about saying, what is the quality of my faith? If you are already doing all of these things, if your life already looks like this, unlooked for, unasked for, there was no carrot that you were pursuing to try to get it, if you're just like, this describes the overflow of my authentic spiritual life right now, we should have a conversation because you should be a leader at our church. And there are different ways that that can look like. There are different ways where leadership is needed in small groups, in prayer, in worship. And if this is who you actually are, then that's a conversation that we should have. If you're not, it's fine. Be a member. And we're belonging together. And that's a wonderful thing. Okay? Um, great. So what's happening in 2024? A year of faith, but really a year of believing. It's time to build again and push and to find a new space. We're looking at various hires to look operationally. What do we need to do to raise our level operationally? We're looking at various financial upgrades. Are there operational upgrades we need? Sunday operations, digital operations, financial, organizational structure. Um, any document of our organizational structure is accessible to you. Leadership is up and running now. So the people who are your small group leaders are people who already have said, this is what's happening in my spiritual life, and I'm committed to help steward and create faith in Vineyard Manhattan. So your small groups have already said, I'm taking on this five bar of faith in my life, and I'm doing this. Um, and we should be worshiping and praying about these things. So if you are going to run a series of worship nights starting January 24th in this season, and Andrew's in charge of the things, and he's going to run them, but one of the things I want us to be doing in that space is praying about these things in particular. Um, some quick pastoral thoughts, and then I promise we're... Um, to pray to, to officially end and move to the question and answer part. Um, our church is moving in this season from what we've been this past year, which is primarily a church that is about our community with one another, into a church that is driven by a particular vision. And you are going to feel that change. Um, it does not mean that you won't have community here. It does not mean that your community structures are going to fall apart. I'm just telling you that you will feel in little things that we are doing, oh, our chief good is not just being together anymore. Mm -hmm. Our chief good is witnessing to the reality of God and calling people to faith. And that is going to lead to little changes that you will feel. If you need pastoral help or, or counseling through that, I would love to, to hear from you about that as you're experiencing those changes. My hope is that the majority of us are bought into where we're going, and so you are actually already saying, I want to go somewhere with community. But that's different from saying, the place we're going is just to community. Right? We've often been doing this this past year, and it's been a right and necessary thing for us to do, but that is going to change. The second thing that I want to give a pastoral note about is that as we are doing organizational upgrades, part of that movement means that we have to address with clarity some of the realities of the low church contemporary tradition that we are in. We exist in a low church contemporary tradition. And you started coming to these churches because you valued uh, what they had to offer in a contemporary style. You were like, all those other old churches are stodgy and whatever, and oh, it's too much stone, I need less stone, I need more reclaimed wood, and you know, whatever it is, all this sort of stuff, right? And, and, and the reality, 
is that there is a, there's a, uh, a way that that can go wrong, but there's a way that that can go right. And there are people who are coming to church in a contemporary tradition because it feels contemporary, because it feels accessible to me out in life and in the world. Here is the rub. When people come into our church, they are assessing us according to a contemporary tradition. And they have the same eyes for assessing whether or not we're good at what we're doing that you have when you walk into any other contemporary space. Right? There's an element of that that can feel not spiritual because I thought we were a church. But the reality is that this is what we are. And it's why you're here already. And when other people come, they're looking for us in the same things. So, you know, we have some things in terms of our total operation that we need to be able to say, what things are we doing operationally that people are walking in going, is that hitting a minimum level of excellence for this tradition for it to not be distracting to me? Some of you know exactly what I'm saying. Some of you are going, does this mean we're going to you know, worship mega church culture and become blah, blah, blah? I, pr I just am asking for your trust. I promise you we're not. But when, <laughs> when you walk into like a store, you know, if nobody helps you, and you like can't find the thing you're looking for, and someone left a big pile of trash in the corner, you're just like, what am I doing here? This place, and, and the reality is that in our church tradition, part of why we've created the space is so that people are, they're looking for, for spiritual community in a way that is close to them with respect to how they are in the world. And so there is a minimum level of things that we have to say, we have to raise the bar organizationally to not just be a small church where we can all do whatever what we're doing, but where we can do something that is recognizable to people who are coming. Do you see what I'm saying? There is a needle to thread here. There is a way to do what I'm talking about that is totally slick, idolatrous, church, whatever. I am asking for your trust that I have no desire in doing that. But there is another element here that is just organizational reality in the world. And people have to walk in here and go, oh, I'm not, I, I recognize it. I'm not distracted by any of the stuff. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That may cause a pastoral challenge for you. I can tell you right now, my heart posture as a pastor, no matter where you are serving and volunteering in the life of the church, no matter what you're doing, my posture is not to say anyone needs to stop doing anything or switch teams or whatever it is. My posture is to say, how can we take all of us in what we're doing and just take a step up together and be looking for the same things together? Okay? There's no one's belonging and anything is going to be on the chopping block here. But we do all need to say, how can we be looking for the same things together so that we're getting some of these organizational things right and growing them up? If you've got more questions about that, I'd love to talk to you about it, but initial pastoral thought. Um, really brief personal update about Stancy tonight, because some of you, we get to the end of these, and you go, how are you doing? And I want to tell you. Um, really short. So summer 2023 was challenging, and I began to feel pretty tired and discouraged, and just feeling like, you know, I, I'm really grateful for where we are now, and there are a lot of wins about where we've gotten to now, but just the reality for me personally is that it's difficult to not feel like I've just failed just over and over again. And, you know, th there's no way to have one of your first experiences as a lead pastor firing your whole staff team and not come away feeling that way. <laughs> Things I never wanted to have to do, right? And so that began to, to get in and begin to feel eroding. And I was grateful to be able to go to the elder team and say, listen, I've got a spiritual dynamic going on right now that I need to be able to talk to somebody about. And, you know, we're not going to freak out about it, but we need to be able to talk about it. And so I'm grateful to the elder team to be able to do that with me. I was in a little bit of that place heading into having a child. <laughs> and I was like, interesting, what's going to happen here? And, and really naturally, somehow during paternity leave, I feel like God has given me a, a really true third wind. I feel like I had a first win to come out here during the pandemic and take over Hope Chelsea, and we got a second win to put together our whole merge church model, and I do feel like God has given me, again, really authentically a third win to say, let's clarify what we're doing right now and push one more time. And so I'm asking you to do that with me. And Stanzi and I, you know, when we came out to New York, I mean, we said really clearly, um, you know, Usually when people come out to New York in their 20s, and they leave in their 30s. And we're like doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so there are some interesting challenges that relate to that. And, and we said really clearly, we do not want to grind out our 30s in New York. If God creates a real way for us to be here, to plant us here, we would love to be in New York. But I, I don't want to grind out my 30s in New York. And the last three to four years have been every bit of a grind. It's been challenging. 
Um, I mean, we woke up one morning and we're in a burning building. Yeah. I mean, I woke up one morning thinking I'm trapped in a burning building. I mean, I, we've gone through some really wild stuff. Um, but we are trusting God again that if God has us here long term, that he is going to plant us. And so we're doing things in our life right now to say, God, are you going to plant us here? Like moving for the third time in four years yeah. to a place where we feel like we could be planted for long time. Like having a child and saying, we're going to figure out how to have a child here. We are doing things that are signs of our desire to continue to trust and believe God that he is going to plant us here. And you should be asking this, of God the same question. Because the way that we live in relationship to New York, many of you live in relationship to that same way. You're asking all sorts of questions all the time about your relationship to the city, and you should be asking God the same thing. God, what are you doing, and are you going to plant, not just, hey, hi, this is how you can scrape along, but are you going to plant me here so that I can give a serious chunk of my life to calling people to faith in New York City and turning New York City into a city that believes in the kingdom of heaven and is a city that is not shaped after the pattern of the cities of human beings, but after the city of God. You should be asking that same question. We are asking that question. We are signing up again for third win, this project, and yeah. we are doing things in our lives as signs of the fact that we believe that God can supplant us here. Okay? That's where we are. If you have more questions, I'd love to tell you. Things I want you to be thinking about. How would my life be different if I actually believed that heaven is real? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that this year. How does God want me to help to call New York City to faith? I want us to begin to think of all these gifts that we have and all these things that we're doing as helping the people behold and believe in the kingdom of heaven. There's proclamation, but there's demonstration. There's empowering the spirit. There's all sorts of different ways. I want you to begin to think in the specificity of who God made you, how that can turn into something that can be calling people to faith in this city. I want you to ask, am I here for the open doors or for the high bar? And both answers are wonderful. That's part of what we're doing in creating a spiritual pasture. If you are here for the open doors, I want you to ask specifically, where am I on my faith journey? And what do I need? What do I feel like I need to be able to grow in my faith? And if you're here for the high bar, I first want you to ask just what does my life look like? But then secondly, where can I get involved to help create and grow faith in others at Vineyard Manhattan in New York City? And really practically, if you have the time, I've got some functional things that I need to be taking care of. And there are a couple people, including Kristen, Andrew's helping me a little bit, who have been like, hey, I've got some time and can help with some of these functional things, like a space search, like thinking about cannons for some strategic hires. Listen, I need an admin. I really do. You know it. I know it. I've done the, my best at administrating. I just, you know, part of this for me right now is I need to grow up and take more responsibility for the functions of my role mapping onto what I'm called to do and what I'm gifted at. And I want to do more and more and more of the things of Moses, ministry of the word, encountering God, calling people to faith, writing, teaching, all those sorts of things. And I want to do, God bless him, less and less of the things of Aaron. Aaron, Aaron is organ He's, I mean, an important spiritual leadership function. He is leading God's people by administrating the life of the community, both in terms of its worship, but the functions of its life, their events, their whole, that is an important task. I need to be doing less and less of it. I'm not doing a good job leading this organization in this moment if I don't begin to say, how can I be in a place where I'm mostly operated and what I feel gifted and called to do? So, God, I need to figure that out. So, many, so anyways, <laughs> lots of things there. Operational excellence, there are some places where we need to upgrade again what we're doing operationally, and maybe you're good at it, and it's time to say, I can help for 90 days to get a, a higher level of execution of something off the ground and then creating faith muscles generally. All right, here we are. You know, for me, with these many slides, I didn't go over as badly as I thought. <laughs> Let me just pray. Hey! I'm going to pray it quickly to just put a spiritual button on that part of the time. And then if any of you need to go, I'm grateful for your time here. I'm grateful for your investment in the church. I'm grateful that you stayed for an extra hour 45 on a Sunday to hear this stuff. Thank you so much. And you should feel free to go. If you're like, good, I don't have any questions, okay? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Vineyard Manhattan, Lord, and we thank you for where we've come from. We thank you for how you've brought us through 2023 and sustained us in 2023. You've even given us more back than we lost. I mean, you, you've given us more than we were asking for or hoping for. 
So God, I, I'm grateful for that, and I thank you for the faithfulness of, of your people who believe in your work here, um, who have been part of sustaining this church in 2023. God, would you be with us in 2024, and Lord, would you be leading us uh, into this vision? Would you be leading us into these changes that our church is going through, and would you be maturing us and growing us up, helping you to see you in our lives that we can call people to believe in you and theirs. I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if anyone's got to go, go ahead. I would love to. Yep, that's totally fine. Thank you so much. Get out of here. Um, who has questions that you would like me to speak to, particular thoughts or feedback that you're just burning to hear about? This is a wonderful time. You can just raise your hand. Yeah. Are you looking for a part-time or full-time admin? In general, I'm looking for part-time. Um, there are a number of things that would be wonderful about having a full-time person, but in general, I'm trying to lead, I'm trying to, to be a little more faithful organizationally in this moment to what organizational leaders would say the right playbook is for an organization of our size. Mm -hmm. And in general, there are a number of operational or administrative tasks that can be done effectively with respect to our size in a part-time position. And that is what I didn't do in 2022, honestly. I said, I am, I'm betting on people who have calling and gifting, and I'm hoping that God grows this and enables us to fill out the organizational stuff along the way. And again, just being really, really frank about this, it didn't work. And so I would be doing a bad job if I weren't saying I need to do something different. So we're looking for something part-time. I'm probably looking at, you know, a 20-hour a week, you know, $40,000 a year sort of thing. So obviously that is limiting, but we are in a city full of people who have multiple things that they're doing, multiple jobs and all sort of stuff. So there are people for whom something like that actually, um, you know, could be a good fit. So, so anyways, did that answer that? Thank you. Yes? Uh, that person doesn't need in New York? No, no, I mean in this, in this room. Yes. No, this is one of the things that you can see written about in the Constitution. I want to be able to run the staff team according to both the membership and the leadership level. So, um, and, and my concern about this is that there are situations where people who are on staff at churches, they go through things in their life or spiritually where they are all of a sudden in a real challenge and a real crisis. And the question that I have been asking about that is, for what people on a church staff does that need to be something where we now take care of that right now? And for what people can we say, you know what, um, I don't know if long term being on a church staff is the best thing for you, but, but, but in reality, you can continue to do these sorts of functions and do them excellently and still be navigating your faith. And so for, for a role like this, like an administrative role, I mean, I'm not saying like, I'm looking for someone who doesn't believe in God and who hates the church. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that actually the person in that role um, does not necessarily need to be like, oh, I'm jumping over the high bar of faith. I've been in it to win it. I've, you know, it can be, you know, there, there are other sorts of criteria that, would, that that person would really need to be in a, in a good spot for. Um, with respect to say, you know, like we say we have a pastor who wakes up one day and is like, my faith is in big trouble. Um, you know, we have language in the Constitution about saying, you know, look, um, we do not want to punish pastors for having a crisis of faith. And uh, we do not, you know, when, when a pastor goes through that, they all of a sudden are asking questions about their livelihood, about their family, about financial provision. Um, and so that becomes a really fraught thing, and there's a temptation for pastors to just begin to fake it. And at the same time, we believe in spiritual reality, and so we believe that pastors need to be people who have living faith who are ministering that to the congregation. So we have created some provisions around what it would look like for staff or pastors to be in those positions, how they should have conversations about it, and how, how the church is committed to caring for those people in the specifics of their situation, including financially, while at the same time saying, do we need to have maybe an immediate, or uh, an intermediate term plan here for how someone else would be in this role. So, um, that was a little bit of a bigger answer. I know you weren't asking all of that question, but um, I, that's that's the sort of thing you'd also find in the church constitution if you were to read it. Yes? Um, so one of the things that I think about in terms of church growth is prayer. Mm -hmm. of prayer. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit to how you see not just individual emotional time, but collective prayer as being part of what you see. 
was being put under the reason for growing a church? Mm, yeah, that's a great question, Alex. Um, I have some thoughts about, you know, we've sort of had two spaces where I've been trying to express that already in the life of the church. One has been our Wednesday morning prayer meetings, right, which really you, me, and Todd, I know Ching, you've been coming to some of those, it's been great to have you, have been stewarding that. Of course, you already know this reality, but for everybody else, it has become near impossible for me to continue the 7 a.m. prayer rhythm since I've had a child. So that is becoming something that I'm having trouble even holding up myself. The second way that we um, embody prayer is in terms of what we're doing on Sundays. I think there are some things with respect to how prayer is working uh, in Sundays in general that I'm hoping will grow in the season um, with respect to even integrating, say, pre-service prayer and, and bringing clarity to that space a little bit, especially with respect to creating faith in our services, but then also um, the wonderful growth that we've seen in um, uh, in, in this space and praying for one another. So those are the two things that I've been sort of doing and identifying already. One thing that I think that we could be doing a better job in that I don't have an immediate solution for is the place that that 7 a.m. prayer rhythm is trying to hold, right? A place of intercessory prayer where we're regularly coming before God for these things. So one of the things we're trying to do in this season is create the worship night space, which is going to be solving some of that issue. But the other reality is just that uh, you know, I, I'm, especially when it comes to like the 7 a.m. stuff, I'm leading out of, out of a rhythm that is just difficult for me in my flesh, right? So I, I would love, this is a little bit where I would come back a little bit and say, I know that there are, are people at the church where one of the primary ways that you experience uh, God's presence in your life and God's presence for other people is through prayer. And if I really have an answer, Alex, for this, it's I would like to be doing a better job getting that leadership out in people and then finding the spaces in our community where, where that is getting out and where we're praying for people in a way where it's having a bit of a bigger impact and it's, it's, it's more of a central function in the life of the church, right? That's the difficult thing about the 7 a.m. prayer thing. We're just all so busy and I, I totally get that. But if we had 15 people signing on the call every week, all of a sudden that space would begin to feel like more of a bedrock of prayer in our community than it actually does, right? So I think if there's a little bit of troubleshooting to try to figure some of that out a little bit. I definitely totally agree and believe that what we are doing is a spiritual thing. And what's happening in the church is a spiritual thing. And if we're not praying, it's like trying to have a plant and not water it. it it's, it's that foolish. It's that simple. It's that foolish. Prayer puts us in touch with spiritual reality. And if we're not praying for the things that we're pursuing, both for the church, but also for what we're trying to do as a church in and for New York, it, it will not happen. If it does, it's because we'll have found some slick way to trick everyone into coming to our church. And, and then we'll be in a church where we all don't want to be in. So, uh, so that's a little bit of an answer to that. I, I suppose it's a bit of a, uh, there, there are more things to think about there. There are some things that I think are in motion that, that are, are helpful potential things. But so there, there's just an initial answer. Um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for doing this and giving us a bunch of two sermons today. I know it's a lot yeah. to do on Sunday. Yeah, and Stancy um, gave me extra time on Saturday to prepare, so, you know, so Saturday's supposed to be my day off, so <laughs> first, thank you for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask about the, your vision for the next building. Are you looking for a place that is shared, that we rent from someone else, or is totally our own, or no. both, or whatever God gives us? Yeah, great question. Um, a little bit whatever God gives us, but I think that there are some things to be thinking about that make some spaces more ideal than others. I think the location actually matters quite a bit because it changes the feel of where people are coming to. And if we are being a church that's calling New York City to faith, we need a church where people feel like they're living at the level of the city. Um, so the location actually is quite important to me. I think it's very likely that we're going to be renting. It would be an act of God <laughs> if somehow... We were able to, I mean, it's, it's, it would be such an act of God, it's almost not even worth it to name. So we're probably going to be renting from someone else. And so then the question becomes, who are we renting from, and how does that help or hinder what we're trying to do? So, you know, one of the reasons why I'm looking into the church across the streets, the Seventh-day Adventist church, is that, um, first of all, it's a church space. So it's not like a school where we have to come in and do a bunch of work to make it feel like a... You know, the reality is that almost no matter where we move, there's probably some operational work to look at our space and what our space feels like, 
right? We're not doing much of that right now, mostly because the quorum disk space is just really nice. But even that, you know, people say, oh, the space feels small. The space feels a little cold. I've had some people say that to me, you know? And those are things you may experience about the space, you know? There are things that we could do to make the space feel that way less. I mostly am not worried about that right now. And actually, this is a little bit of a tangent. Part of the reason why I'm not worried about that right now is because I thought that we could double in size here, and I actually think that I was wrong. So I, I meant to say this earlier in, in the um, service. You know, last year when we were hearing about the vision and stuff, I was like, we're about to go to Easter, we'll do two services, and once we do two services, we'll be at 100 people, and away we'll go. But I actually think the d dynamics of this space are so small that whenever we start to run a second service, it would have to be utterly full in order for people to come in and not feel like, oh gosh, what's going on here, mm -hmm. right? There, there's like a rule, and again, I don't love these things, they don't feel spiritual to me, but they're organizational realities. When people come into a space like this, they are looking for it to be like 60 to 75% full. If it's less than that, they think that nothing's happening here, and if it's more than that, they feel like there's no room. Mm. And the Quorum Deo space is small enough that it's very difficult to get that dynamic right in two services. Mm -hmm. We need to actually be in a space that's double the size in order to fill up that one, and then we should be able to double a service in that next space. So I meant to say that earlier, forgot about it. Um, but what all that means for us in terms of you know, looking for a new space is that we're trying to say um, you know, what, what positives and negatives exist in the sorts of spaces that we could rent. Probably the most important, after location, the most important thing, thing is meeting time. Um, so, you know, I looked at a, a wonderful Salvation Army space that's, uh, for me, it's like on 45th between 8th and 9th or 47th. It's a beautiful theater space. It's about double the size of this. It's gorgeous, gorgeous space. They turned down my request for it anyways, which I was bummed by, but I already knew it was probably not going to be a um, uh, contender because it, it had only evening availability in Sundays, which I think could be a thing we do in the future but it would make it so difficult for families to just have an evening offer. It's probably a non-starter for us. So then that means that some spaces have like early Sunday noon availability, which is maybe other churches. The reason why the Seventh-day Adventist church is such a potentially attractive option, even though it's a little further west than I wish it was, Seventh-day Adventist meet on Saturdays. So we'd have all day Sunday availability, including in the mornings, right? So that all of a sudden becomes super, super helpful because um, there's not many churches that have Sunday morning availability in our tradition in Midtown, right? Um, so, uh, you think about that, you think about meeting time, and then you think about space function and what do we have. So, you know, what, what does the sanctuary space feel like? How is it helping or hurting us? What do we need to do to help that space have a good feel? You know, it, um, a church space has different pluses and minuses to like some cool, like a, I don't know, a hotel lobby that's got glass window, not lobby, but you know, like a conference room, but you know, maybe like glass windows, you see some in New York. It, you know, you just imagine those sorts of things and the different benefits that they would have or, or challenges. You think about what kind of storage we could have there. That's super important because we're going to have to set up and tear down every single week. You think about space for kids. You have to have that. Um, and, then, and then the sanctuary space has to be within a certain, a certain size um, dynamic so that we don't repeat the challenges of we're in the St. Paul Sanctuary or we're in the PS162 or we're in a space that's slightly too small for us to grab like here, right? So we need a space that just... Um, hits all those markers. So does that make sense? So I suppose the big picture answer is probably renting, and then we're looking at sp we're looking at different things, including geographical location, dynamics of the space, and time availability, and then functions of the space to be aligned with what we are right now, right? Um, and the funny thing is, is that a church is sort of on the journey that we're in. We could have a space that does that for a year, and then all of a sudden we go, oh man, the, the organization reality has changed just slightly, and we have to change that again. So, but that's where we are. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Jeff. So you mentioned, um, I'm not sure how to explain or to ask this question, but how does it do with membership, membership and leadership? Mm -hmm. If you're not a member or a leader, I was curious about like, the timetable of when you can become one. Yeah. Or are those people being pushed out? No. Like, they won't be excluded. So of course. It, it's still a little more formalized than it was in the past. I'm just curious. I mean, you know, yeah. No, you're, you're right, Jeff. It is. There is an element of this that is more formalized than it was in the past. Um, no one who, for whatever reason, does not say want to become a member is going to be kicked out of the church. Um, you know, you can go to small groups and do all your stuff, you know, whatever. There, there may be some things where if someone really is just in a tender, you know, I, I mean, gosh, you know, maybe like a leader or a, a member is better suited to lead certain kinds of social events or something. So that there may be certain things that we say, sure, just a 
a, an attender isn't doing or something, but in terms of like, oh my gosh, can attenders not be here or something? No. Um, there are certain things that I would really hope people who have been attending here for a long time that you would say, I want to be a member. You know, I, 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 would, I would hope that membership is essentially saying, I belong here. And if you believe that already, I hope that you would say, well, gosh, all I'm doing with membership is formalizing the fact that I belong here. And I hope that people would want to do that. Um, if someone just wants to say, I just want to attend, you know, dip in and out when I want, but then I want to come to a space like this in the future, I would say, you know, gosh, I'll treat that on a case-by-case -case basis, but, like, it's time for our church to, to have some real structures of belonging. So, so there's a little bit of a, of a push and a pull there. Um, in terms of, hi, hi, baby. In terms of, hi, you smiler. Hi. <laughs> Very good smile, yeah. In terms of timeline, membership, my guess in terms of rolling that out, is probably, it, it's probably gonna, it's going to come along with um, moving into the new space. Because right now, if we rolled out membership, it would just feel a little bit silly because we don't have enough people for, for them to have this ecosystem of people coming in, but do they belong, are they not, and then we have a core group of members, and then we have leaders. It's just right now, we really are like a, a core team of people. And so most people here feel like they have buy-in, and if I roll out membership for you right now, it's gonna be like, oh yeah, I'm, I kind of already am this thing, right? Um, it also has the potential to create like a leader member hierarchy, which is not at all the points. The point is to offer people structures that correspond to their spiritual reality, where they actually are, and to just be in such a small group of people where we're like, oh, now I'm not a leader or a member. And, it's, and then you feel really on the outside, right? So probably membership is waiting for when we move into a new space and maybe get to like an 80 or 100 person mark. So you don't have to be in any rush. You don't have to be nervous about, oh my gosh, is there a timeline? Do I need to get the membership thing set up? You know, you don't have to be worried about that. And again, no. No one who, for any reason, is like, I don't want to formally be a member here. I don't know why. I don't like it. It feels formal. I feel tied down. I'm a free spirit. I want to be able to go wherever I want to on Sunday. That's totally fine. They're, you're not going to be kicked out or excluded or anything like that. So does that help to speak to that question, Jeff? Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Whatever you decide to get yourself. And then next week... Lunch, lunch, lunch. Oh, yeah. Starting next week is lunch, 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 lunch. Lunch for days. All right. If you have further questions that for some reason you didn't feel comfortable asking in this space, I would love to hear from you. You can talk to me personally. You can send me an email. You can say, hey, I want to read some of these documents, whatever it is. I would love to be able to be in touch with you about that. All right. Other than that, we're officially ending. Thank you for being with us on a marathon Sunday. I'm really looking forward to next week. I hope that all of you are coming to Emotionally Healthy Relationships and that you're, you've got your stuff, and you're going to eat, and we're going to learn, and we're going to build connection, and we're going to get better at being in a relationship with people. Yeah. I'm so excited about it, and I hope to see you all stay after next Thank week you. for a little bit more fun and less laborious time than it is today. So. Thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah.